Welcome to episode 23 of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Today, my interview is with crime and mystery writer Katie Munger. Katie's latest book, Desolate Angel, is available in bookstores now and is published under the pen name Chaz McGee. Stay tuned for my interview with Katie Munger. This is Lee Child, and I'm listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast. So welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Katie Munger, author of the recently released mystery novel, Desolate Angel, published by Berkeley's Prime Crime imprint under the pseudonym Chaz McGee. Previously, Munger published five books in the Casey Jones mystery series under her own name, and Munger's first published books were in a third series, the, the Hubbard and Lille books, published under the pseudonym Gallagher Gray. Katie, welcome to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thank you, Jeff. It's nice to be here. <laughs> Great. Well, the first question is, um, in doing research for this interview, I, I actually discovered that you have something in common with President Obama. You, you were originally born in Honolulu. So I'm curious if you have various people accosting you on the street, asking you about the validity of your birth certificate. <laughs> You know, when they started bringing that up, the first thing I thought was how when I was a child, my brother used to tease me that I could never be president because I wasn't technically born in a state. So then when he got elected, I thought, oh, dang, I missed my shot at it. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, he, he was a whore. Of course, the, the, the hard thing for me is to realize that I'm actually older than our president, I believe. I think I was born before him, too, even uh. so. <laughs> well, well, no one has to know that, right? So in, in all seriousness, you, you grew up mainly in the American South, correct? I was born in Hawaii, and we lived there for about three years and then moved to the Greensboro area. And I've uh, spent my whole life growing up in either Greensboro or Raleigh, and primarily Raleigh, North Carolina. Gotcha. Well, a lot of writers know at an early age that they love writing and making up stories. I wonder if that's the case with you. When did you originally kind of get the writing bug, so to speak? That, that was definitely the case with me. Like a lot of people, when I was little, I would, you know, make my own newspaper with family news, and I would write stories and put together little books. Of course, back then you had to use notebook paper and staples. You didn't even have a copy machine to make multiple copies. And um, when I was in high school, uh, Big, a fan of creative writing in the literary magazines, but um, the problem with me was that my parents wanted me to be a writer, and they had both been newspaper reporters, and they wanted the novelist in the family. And of course, you know, eventually, even a rule follower like me is going to rebel. And I didn't decide, well, if that's what they wanted to be, me to be a writer, I'd be damned if I was going to be a writer. So even though I went to college in creative writing at UNC Chapel Hill, I actually. Saw sort of uh, moved away from it for a while, and it wasn't until I was 30 that I realized that I really did want to be a writer, and I turned to it in earnest. Great. Um, what were? Do you remember some of the books that you read and, and enjoyed as a child, any that made a, a particular impact on you? My house was so full of books because my father was a book reviewer, among other things literally couldn't move without tripping over stacks of them, and there was no oversight or censorship of the books I read. So I read all kinds of books well beyond my maturity level. A couple stand out. One, I remember every saw camping as a family, and we'd be going through the most beautiful country you've ever seen in Canada, and I would be in the back seat of the family station wagon, you know, just reading Ian Fleming's James Bond novels till my eyes bled. I would just read them for hours at a time. I old, um, you know, English mystery classics. I read Agatha Christie and Ruth Rindle and Niall Marsh growing up. Um, of course, Sherlock Holmes. I just read widely across a lot of different topics. The only book my mother ever took away from me when I was 
10, I think, or 11, and stuck in my bedroom, and I was reading Miss Lonely Hearts by Nathaniel West, and she kind of looked at it for a moment and looked at me, and then she held her hand out, and she goes, I think I'm going to hold one that one back for a couple more years yet. And that was it. I never went back and finished it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I really <laughs> one day. <laughs> That's great. Well, well. after you grew up in the South, you, you ended up moving to New York City in 1980. And as you mentioned earlier, you had your first book or you, you wrote your first novel, Hubbard and Lil, um, when you were 30. I was curious, what what exactly prompted you? I know you said you majored in creative writing. Was there was there any kind of epiphany that, that made you sit down and say, OK, I'm going to do this in earnest? Well, if I recall, if I recall correctly, and it was a while ago, I think that I had sort of vaguely decided that I had some stories inside of me that needed to come out. And in fact, there was one particular novella that I, you know, felt I really wanted to write, and that was not a mystery, a contemporary fiction about um, sort of an old man whose granddaughter takes him out of the nursing home and takes him back to Illinois, where he was from before he dies. And I started writing that. It was, it was a pretty laborious process. I didn't particularly enjoy it. There was a lot of New York literary sitting on our shoulders. I remember um, being on vacation and reading, I think it was uh, Robert Cray's The Monkey's Ray, I think it was, and something about that particular book and how contemporary it was and sort of the modern tone of voice of it. I remember reading it and thinking, you know, I could do that. I, I That sounds more like my voice and the kind of thing I want to say than this other book I'm trying to write. And, and um, I believe I finished two books at the same time, one this literary fiction book and the other a mystery, uh, which was my first Gallagher Gray. And I think that because I enjoyed writing the mystery book a lot more than the other one, it showed in better pace. Um, characters that flowed, it wasn't as forced or, or staged, and that actually was uh, the book that sold first. Um, and the publisher, Donald F. Fine, offered to bring out the literary book as well, and for some reason we decided not to, my agent at the time, and I decided not to, and I stuck with the mystery book. Interesting. What, what is it about the mystery genre that appeals to you as a writer? I heard during the question of why I write crime fiction pretty much exclusively, and my reasons are changing. I think that I got into it because I came from a real bohemian, free-for-all, chaotic household, and I sort of coped with that by being very much a rule follower in school and outside my home, and I found a lot of security in following the rules, and I think that a part of me probably resented that I felt the need to be such. I look back on myself as a goody two-shoes and kind of resented the people that got to break the rules, and I think part of me felt like, oh, they should be punished. Who do they think they are? They don't have to follow the rules like the rest of us. And then I inherited, I think, a legacy of really hating bullies and hating people that hurt other people and move on. My mother was a big champion of the underdog, and she would get outraged on other people's behalf. And I think those two forces together, you get a person who really wants to write about people who, who think that society's rules don't apply to them and hurt other people and, and harm them or take what they want from them. And I think probably my love of kind of grew out of wanting to see those people, even the fictional prototypes of them, punished to the extent I felt that they should be punished. Um, and that's why I think I got into it. Um, lately, I've been kind of re-examining it, and I honestly think that it could come down to something simple as, are you the kind of person that believes that people are essentially good versus essentially evil? Do you believe that good will triumph over evil? And I think I'm really a big believer that uh, people are essentially very good and, and that good must to triumph over evil, and that my books, honestly, in many ways, are simply about that battle and good prevailing in the end and justice being done. Your latest book, Desolate Angel, was published several months ago by Berkeley Prime Crime under the Chas McGee pseudonym. Uh, I've, I've read a lot of mysteries and suspense fiction, and I have to say, I thought that Desolate Angel has an extremely interesting hook to it. I'm wondering if you can describe the book and, and kind of the hook behind it for people listening who may not have read it yet. 
Desolate Angel is probably the only book I've ever written where the idea for it came to me sort of in epiphany. And um, I think actually I was lying in bed about to go to sleep and I had this idea and I thought to myself, what I need, I, I need a hero who's being given the ultimate second chance. I have this, you know, great love for fallen people and people who realize their potential and I'm just a magnet for those kinds of people who have sort of just self-destructed and I believe that they're essentially good and can become something better than they are. Now, in real life, that's probably a really horrible pattern to indulge in, but I started, you know, thinking about, well, I can't change the real people in my life and make them see the world through my eyes, which I love being here. I love being alive and in this world, even the sad parts of it, but maybe I could create a fictional character like that. So I, I came up with the idea um, and and it ha- I'm not the first one to do this. It has been done before by a couple people, but I came up with the idea of the dead detective. And what it is is that Kevin Fahey was a really lousy cop. He was a horrible alcoholic. He was mired in self-pity. He ignored, overlooked, and hurt his wife, his family, just because he was so invested in his own inability to live up to his potential. And he wasted his life. And, um, and then he was killed in the line of duty and a desolate angel begins after he's been killed and it's a few months after he has discovered that he is dead but he has not gone on to any other plane he's sort of wandering the plane of the living see and hear him, but he can see and hear everything in his old town. And a couple things happen. One, he begins to realize what he wasted and overlooked and squandered about his life and has a new appreciation for it. And number two, he begins to get a glimmer that if he move on to whatever next stage in his existence is, he needs to redeem himself. And he needs to redeem himself by undoing some of the damage he did when he was alive and incompetent. And of course, since he was a detective, a lot of the damage he did was that he did not solve cases or he put innocent people in jail or if he overlooked the pain of the you know surviving loved ones of the victims. So he starts to think that if he is going to be able to go on, he's got to help solve current crimes and um, undo some of the damage he did. So, of course, that's, that's one aspect of the novel. The other was I needed a more immediate, alive, more pro- active and capable um, protagonist, so he falls in love with a female detective named Maggie Gunn, or it's not really love, it's different from our kind of love, physical love, he's fascinated with how she is and her life force, and um, he actually starts helping her as she solves uh, a serial murder case, and he has a uh, unique ability she doesn't. He can kind of rummage through people's minds. He can access their memories. He can what they're really feeling, no matter what they're showing. And so between the two of them, Maggie Gunn being a very capable detective and him being able to so, sort of go into people's minds and then get the message to her in different ways, um, they make a pretty powerful duo and end up solving this case and some other mysteries as well. That's great. That's great. Um, very interesting. I, I'm curious. You 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 gave the anecdote earlier, or or you you um, recounted how you were laying in bed and had this idea. I'm curious if you, at that point, not that night, but you know, shortly after that, started writing it. Or I wonder if there was a period where you kind of doubted the idea and and said, "No, nah, I'm not sure if that would work." When I when I first had the idea, I thought, oh, God, you know, get up, get out of bed, write it down. And then I spent a little time seeing who else had done it. You know, I don't like to dive in and put a lot of work into something that's already been done. And I saw that it had not been done the way I wanted to do it. Um, and then I did spend some time mulling over in my mind what I wanted the tone to be, because I thought that was really, really critical. I mean, first I wrote cozies, and then I wrote sort of, you know, cheeky, kind of uh, insouciant P.I., and, and neither one of those tones were me anymore sure you know how I felt really and and the sort of um, atmosphere I wanted this book to have so before I proceeded with the idea I really had to nail down the tone and it ended up being very melancholy actually um, and, and kind of sweet and, and thoughtful and I decided that I wanted to tackle a book that was going to be a little bit deeper than I had ever written before 
but I had to get used to that idea. So that also stalled me beginning the project for a while. And then I always, when I write a book, first have to let it percolate in my mind, and it becomes peopled with characters, and then connections between the characters. And then, you know, I'm a really big believer in the architecture of a book. So in my mind, I also had to start sort of mapping out the different scenes, the different events, and turning points in the plot. And... I probably worked this over in my mind for almost a year before I ever sat down and put anything down on paper. Gotcha. And now that you're mentioning that, am I mistaken? Because I guess I should mention for people who are listening to this that we've known each other for a while. Am I mistaken? Didn't you show me when you were living in New York like a flow chart that you had made for one of your um, Gallagher Gray novels? Yes. I did. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I belong to this sort of informal group of writers in North Carolina. They're all women crime writers. We're all published, and we all have different approaches to writing. And I'm famous within my friends for these elaborate um, sort of spatially oriented flow charts because that's how I see the world and order the world. I mean, you should see these things. They start at free rules. I might, you know, say this plot point's going to happen in a circle around it, and then that connects to a, a circle of another event, and then there's maybe squares of this character has an epiphany, this character dies, this character realizes something big, and everything gets connected with, you know, lines and solid lines, and, you know, there's all these ideas that spring across it. It's like an explosion of ideas on paper, and then I use lines and circles and squares to tie it all together. And it's only after I've done that that I sort of take it and I turn it into yet another more ordered flow chart. I tend to sort of map out character development for each character through the length of the book and then plot points through the length of the book and then clues through the length of the book. And then once I have this kind of big at-a-glance flowchart of a book, I will sit down and I'll actually outline each scene um, pretty much maybe a quarter to half a page for each scene on what needs to happen and what I want to remember to really get across in that scene. And it's only after I have all that preparation that I will sit down and begin a book and actually start it and, and putting the prose down. Um, and I do this for a couple reasons. One, that's how my mind works. Um, the structure is very important to me, especially when you're writing crime fiction or mystery. You have to be really careful that you've got clues along the way and, um, you know, character development and relationships in the books are becoming increasingly important to me as I mature as a writer and to map those out carefully too. And it really, in the end, saves me time, I think, in cutting down on the amount of rewriting I need to do, on cutting down on wasted words that I have to cut out later on. Um, and probably most importantly of all, I don't have a lot of time to write in my life, and I don't. I'm going to get. I don't have a regular time to write. So if I've got this this map to the book and an outline, no matter when I have to start and how little time I have, I can usually just sit down and hit the ground running because I can look at these things and know where I was when I left off. So all of those things seem like it's an awful lot of uh, circling around the book, but I think in the end what happens is I end up with a better structured book and an easier writing process for me. That's that's an interesting process. I mean, it's it's fascinating how everyone is different in in terms of getting a finished book completed. It, it is. I have friends who are, they call themselves organic writers, where they will literally sit down and look at a blank computer screen and not know what they're going to do for that day. I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure I've got the attention span to sit there and wait for it to come to me. I'm afraid I'd go up and eat coffee and stuff where you know that they would be over. So I never sit down and look at a blank screen. I've usually got an outline or something at my um, side to get me going. Sure. I, I actually interviewed Lee Child for this podcast and at Thriller Fest in New York City. And according to him, and, and I don't have any reason to doubt him, he has no outline and he usually doesn't know beyond 10 pages out where he's going. And according to him, he, he rarely does go wrong. He might, he might stop and go back a few pages, but it's kind of a rarity. So I was kind of, I was kind of blown away. 
you know, wow, he may have a lot he holds in his head. Now, I will say this. Well, two things, actually, I'd like to say about it. Number one, I don't, I'm not a slave to my outlines and my structure, and lots of times a character will take on a life of his or her own and take me off in some direction, and I follow that. Um, or I'll realize as I get into it that the ending needs to be changed and the murder needs to be changed or what have you, and I'm with that. Um, so, you know, it's more of a guideline, and it's not a, a straitjacket or anything. But the other thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, Jeffrey Deaver spoke. He lives near me now, and he spoke at one of our bookstores, and he actually says, and I don't know if this is true or not, that he takes him approximately 12 months to write a book, and he will spend 10 of those 12 months outlining his book and then he writes it in the remaining two months i was gonna say that is a man after my own heart <laughs> <laughs> no i i've i've heard that from him not the not the writing it in two months but i i actually read an interview with him that if i'm not mistaken he said that he outlined one book for an entire year before he sat down and started writing page one which is wow i mean i'm kind of amazed by that but Anyway, so recently you started a publishing company, Thalia Press, to publish your backlist. I, I wonder what made you decide to do that. I, it's, it's really funny. I think people are motivated by different things, but all writers love their books, like to some extent, like their children. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sad that you pour your heart, your soul, your sweat, your blood into a book, and, it, and then it's out and it makes a splash, if you're lucky, for six months. And then it slowly kind of fades behind you and bobs in the current further, further behind you. And, you know, reprints are rare, and you, then you start to pick up, at the same time, you're picking up new readers with each book, especially if you're writing a series. And I have never willingly liked this idea of, of, you know, my books going out of print and people not being able to go back and get them um, and have never really had a commitment, a strong commitment from a publisher to keep them in print. So we decided, my um, business partner, Lisa McClendon, who's a crime writer from um, Montana, to uh, start our own press Reprints, because, of course, with print-on-demand technology now, with very little overhead, you can go ahead and bring any books you own the rights to back in print fairly easily. And more importantly, in the last three or four years, the quality of these books has really gone up. Now, you know, my Casey Jones series was in track. So, I mean, I'm sorry, not trade paperback. It was in mass market paperback. So they were far after a couple of years, too. So I also wanted a more durable edition of the Casey Jones books. So, you know, one, one of the uh, reasons behind starting this press was simply to get the books back in print. But I have to tell you, to be perfectly honest, one of the things that motivated me was simply that the covers for my Casey Jones series were, A, god-awful, two, one had absolutely nothing to do with the next one, the all over the map until you got to books four and five, and those kind of matched. And, you know, I I just used to look at those covers, and it would drive me insane. And only one of them really reflected what was actually in the book. And I thought, oh, for heaven's sakes, you know, at the very minimum, your publisher should give you a decent cover. I'm just going to have to do this for myself. And, and um, although I have not gotten to bring in the Casey books out, because I wanted to start with the Gallagher Grays, and, and you know, they're a cozy series and some of my older readers, um, you know, I wanted to bring those out for them. Um, uh, we will eventually get around to bringing the reprints of the Casey's back as well. And we've got a beautiful design system and they'll have a uniform look and they're bigger type and easier to read and they're trade paperback. So they'll last longer too. Interesting. So have you, have you started thinking about what you want the covers to be for the Casey Jones? They are um, they're pretty cutting edge. I had a, a friend of mine who's a graphic designer in Washington, D.C., design them for me, and they kind of combine some harsh eroding textures with stark photographs, and uh, there's a color palette, so each cover is a different color, but uh, if you were to put them side by side, they'd be very beautiful together and they're kind of rich slightly bright colors and I just loved being able to sort of play around with those in addition to seeing the words come back to life inside them I, I did bring out one original Casey bad to the um, sorry bad moon on the rise and uh, because of that I got to do one of the Casey and it was a lot of fun that's great 
Um, well, currently the, the publishing industry, as you know, is undergoing a lot of accelerated change with the, the fast rise in electronic books. Uh, the popularity of Amazon's Kindle, and now there's this rumored Apple tablet computer that may be or may not be announced next week. I'm curious if you if you spend any time thinking about the book publishing industry in terms of a business and where you think it may be headed. Well, I think that clearly ebooks and whatever format are the future. And for one thing, we have to acknowledge that they're a lot more affordable for readers. You know, you can buy a book for an awful lot less and store them and take them with you. I mean, you, we just can't fight that. And personally, I think we should be grateful that there is a medium which supports book links stories and entertainment pieces and acknowledge that I don't think they're ever going to totally replace physical books. I mean, there's just some, something about the experience of you in a book um, that you can hold in your hand and take to the doctor's office while you wait or whatever. I, mm-hmm. I do think industry needs to adapt. I'm not sure that um, it's the uh, adapting to technology that's holding us up right now. They seem to kind of jump on that technology bandwagon pretty well. I mean, and they certainly tried their best to screw the authors out of what they're due, but I don't believe they're going to get away with that. But I do think that the public needs to rethink the way that it buys authors' works and publishes them. I mean, I see a lot of parallels between the uh, the music industry where lots of times it feels like they're buying titles simply to keep their competitors from getting them. So what they're kind of doing is clearing out the market and they're bringing these titles in-house, but they have no intention of publicizing them. They have, I don't know what they're doing. I, I call it, you know, just like when you cook spaghetti and you want to know if it's al dente, you cook it and then you throw it on the wall and you see what sticks. Well, Sometimes it feels like that's what publishers are doing, and they're buying huge books, no hope whatsoever. They're just going to sink like a stone. I just got through clearing out two rooms in my house, and I have almost 20 cartons of crime fiction from the last seven years. And out of those cartons, probably 80% of the books have these amazing blurbs on them. So-and-so is is the next Lee Child. So-and-so is the next Jeffrey Deaver or the next world. Ever astonishing bestseller, blah blah blah, and you've never heard of these people again. So something, something's wrong, and the quality of a lot of these books is just crap. Uh, you know, I say it now. I, I didn't used to say that because I had to go to conventions and rub elbows with a lot of the authors and stuff. But a lot of these books, they have no business being published because they're not original. They're just chasing someone else who had a bestseller and they're copying him or her. And, and I think that what we what happened was not only did publishers burden them themselves with a lot of upfront costs to put out these books, but we really cluttered the landscape. There's so much noise. You know, a good book, an original book, it couldn't fight all the other books for attention. And, you know, that was harmful. That was, uh, you know, as more and more and more books just accelerated and got published, you know, we created our monster. And I really think that, you know, shrinking back and buying less authors is going to be hard on people who are authors, but I think it might be the only way that um, publishing is going to survive going forward. That's interesting. Um, I'm I'm curious. You used to review books for the Washington Post. Uh, who who are you reading now that that you that stands out for you? It, it, you know, it doesn't have to be mystery. Who, whoever you may be reading. Well, I uh, my reading tastes have really changed a lot in in uh, recent years, and I have really veered away from sort of the PI fiction or funny things, and I've gotten kind of into deeper uh, books lately, and I still read quite a lot of crime fiction, um, you know, just for my purposes as a writer because I enjoy being caught up in the story. Uh, recently, I read Bone by Bone by Carol O'Connell, and I really love her work because um, although there was a crime at the heart of the story, it was really about 
quirky town with very unique characters. And most of the book was devoted sort of to the relationships between these characters and the histories of them. And there was a beautiful kind of story being told in how she saw these people. Um, and it was just a really interesting book and clearly a lot of depth to it. Um, so I'm kind of to more layered things like that. I, I'm, I've no, I've stopped being a big fan of the thriller where there's a twist and then a turn and then a twist and then a turn because it became for, for a formula after a while. There were just so many of those. Um, and unbelievable. I'm no longer really a big um, serial killer novels because to me, no one will ever have the heart that Thomas Harris puts into his books. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, Thomas Harris was able to write about how our society creates these monsters and how we're all culpable for it. And he was trying to show us that we are the reason why these people explode in this horrific violence and they feel alienated and maybe the way we glorify their violence and killing is something we should not be doing. And, you know, instead the poor man puts out these books and they become huge bestsellers. And what do people kind of worship about them but the violence, the very violence he was buying. So, I don't know, now the guy lives in, a, I think, a condo in Miami and no one ever sees him and, and I don't blame him. Um, but the people that came along and sort of started writing after him, I haven't found one yet that kind of captures the connection between the horror and the fear the serial killers, you know, evoke in you and, and how it connects back to the people and, you know, how we choose to spend our lives and what we consider important. Um, now, having said that, I did just get through reading of Val McDermott, and I, I really enjoyed it because, you know, Val's incredible intelligence just totally shows through on every page. It just crackles. It's so well written, and um, there's a lot going on, different threads and relationships. Um, so I do like her work. I, I don't particularly like the level of violence in some of her books because I just don't. That's not what I prefer to focus on, but her writing I admire a great deal. And, uh, you know, I, I like to read Laura Lippman because I feel like um, beyond the stories, she's always saying so much about our world and society and all kinds of things and friendships. And um, I love that about her. There's something deeper about her books. So I've been, you know, moving more toward deeper books and I guess uh, away from what you would find at the very top of the bestseller list, I guess. Sure. Sure. Um, well, as we wrap up, I, I'm curious if you have any advice or tips for people listening who may be aspiring writers. If I were just starting out today, what I would like would be to have someone sit me down and say to me, look, before you start writing, you need to decide why you want to write. And unless you're writing because you absolutely have to, you have something to say, you need to get it out, and you want people to hear it, then prepare for a lot of heartache, because that's about the only thing that writing can offer you is the opportunity to try to do that. Once you decide that might be why you want to, and you have these things you want to say, then you would be a much happier person if you acknowledge that you know, we live in a very diversified world. You're never going to write a book that everybody likes, but if you really put your heart and soul into it, you will write a book that really connect to, your words will resonate with some people, people that share what it is you're feeling as you write this book. They'll find you. They'll find you, but you have to believe in that book. You have to stay true to the vision and the tone and the message you have when you book. And if you do that, if you build it, they will come. Your, your readers will find you. But, you know, just recognize that the more your book is tailored to an audience or a group, the more it goes out on the limb in terms of tone and atmosphere and plot, um, the more you're also going to get criticism for people who don't do it, and that's going to come with the territory too. So, you know, in the end, just find your readers. Write your book and find readers, and it's a beautiful thing when that happens, and it'll feel good. Great. That's great advice. Well, again, we've been speaking with Katie Munger. Her latest book, Desolate Angel, published under the pseudonym Chaz McGee, is available in bookstores now. So go buy it. You can find Katie online at katiemunger.com, and she also blogs at Breakfast in Bed, 
two. So it's breakfast in bed with the number two dot wordpress dot com. So thanks, Katie. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was really fun talking to you tonight. This is David Morrell, and when I'm not working on my latest thriller, I'm listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks for listening to my latest interview. If you like what you heard, I would really appreciate a review of the podcast in iTunes. It's really simple. All you have to do is go to the iTunes store, and it takes a minute or two to leave a quick review of the podcast. And that way, more people can find the podcast, because the more reviews and ratings a podcast has in the iTunes store, the more they feature it and the more prominently they feature it. So hope you enjoyed the interview. Until next time, read some good books and support your local independent bookstore. And I'll be back soon with another interview with a writer that you enjoy reading. Back to school season is here and summer is still going strong. Visit Wetco to protect your car's paint from bugs and damage caused by UV rays. Ceramic wax keeps it shiny. If you're a teacher, student, or school staff, we'll give you 50% off a car wash between now and September 11th. Just show your school ID in store or sign up for unlimited washes and cram in all the washes you want for one monthly price starting at $14.99 per month. Go back to school at your brightest. Visit getvillecafe.com slash unlimited today. For the one standing guard. For the eagle-eyed, for the knights in shining armor, and for all those who support them, we are Granger, your experienced safety partner, offering supplies and solutions for every industry, committed to helping keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com/safety, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.